31st, 2009. Air France Flight 447 takes off at night from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. The Airbus 330, carrying 228 passengers and crew, is scheduled to arrive the next morning in Paris, France. Planes flying this route traverse an enormous distance across the Atlantic Ocean. There's a point where, during this transoceanic flight, radar coverage is non-existent. And it's incumbent upon the pilots to perform at certain checkpoints. About three hours into the flight, the pilots check in at Intol Point. It will be the last verbal contact made by Flight 447. The plane hits moderate turbulence as it passes through an area known as the Intertropical Convergence Zone. Here, winds from the northern and southern hemispheres collide and can produce severe storms. About 30 minutes later, the flight is expected to show up in Senegal's airspace. But the crew doesn't check in with Senegal's air traffic controllers. Air France 447 is missing. In the light of day, an aerial search team is deployed. They scour miles around the plane's last known position. Is this plane on top of the water somewhere? Uh, are people alive? But by early afternoon, officials with Air France and the French government presume that the airplane is lost to the sea. This is a catastrophe, undoubtedly. And we have lost an aircraft with 228 people on board. If there is any doubt about the fate of Flight 447, five days later, grim discoveries confirm it. Bodies, boarding passes, and small pieces of the plane are found floating on the surface of the ocean. The next day, the first major piece of wreckage is found, the vertical stabilizer. But there are still more questions than answers about what downed the Airbus 330. Evidence of an in-flight breakup. Did it all start with a lightning strike? Investigators will need to locate the main fuselage and along with it, the flight recorders. These brightly colored orange devices, commonly known as black boxes, are equipped with water-activated acoustic locator beacons, or pingers, that remain active for 30 days. This is the pinger. This is what we are looking for in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. But 30 days comes and goes, and the flight recorders haven't been found. Without the information they contain, the investigation into the cause of the crash is at a standstill. After nearly a year of searching underwater, French investigators turned to the world leaders in ocean exploration for help, the Massachusetts-based Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. For the scientists there, this isn't the first time they've searched the bottom of the Atlantic for an ill-fated passenger vessel. We're the people that found the Titanic, and it was through a collaboration with the French, and here we are again. So in many ways, it is history repeating itself. But trying to find Air France 447 will be daunting. The plane is believed to be lost in one of the most mysterious and hard-to-reach places on Earth. Right in the middle of the oceans, there's a mountain range. It's the greatest mountain range on Earth. It's called the Mid-Ocean Ridge. It's 50,000 miles long, and it winds around the Earth like the seams of a baseball. Mostly unexplored, but some of the most incredible dramatic topography on Earth. There, the average depth of the ocean stretches for two miles. If you're looking for the black boxes, it's akin to looking for something the size of a shoebox in the Rocky Mountains at night with a flashlight, having no maps of the area. It's like finding the needle in the haystack, but first you've got to find the haystack. The search area was sort of defined as uh, a 40-mile radius circle around that last known position, and that's a, a very big area. If you draw that circle in the middle of New England, it includes Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. So we needed to narrow that down and what we asked the modelers to do, the people that understood wind and waves and floating things, was get us in the right haystack, and then we'll take it from there. The team launches three autonomous underwater vehicles to comb the ocean floor. 
We're looking at the Remus 6000 vehicle right now. And you know, one of our primary sensors is side scan sonar. You will swim almost 10 miles in one direction and the vehicle every second will be sending out a ping and tie all those pings together and we get a pretty good map of what's on the seafloor. In a heartbeat, you could miss a plane on the bottom and that would have been less than a minute's worth of uh, data. After finishing a month-long expedition at sea, the team comes up empty-handed. Was the wrong haystack. We're confident that given enough time uh, and resources that we would find the plane. Nearly a year later, and with a new haystack identified, they set out for their second expedition. Within the first week, a promising lead. They find something on sonar two and a half miles down. A smudge on the seafloor that didn't look like it belonged there. It's about 200 meters wide, 600 meters long. We uh, got the vehicles back on board. Uh, we reprogrammed one to go back to that site and use our cameras to uh, take pictures over the site. There was no doubt uh, when those first images came back that that was the uh, aircraft. There were the, the landing gear, the engines, and other bits of the aircraft. There were bodies still on the seafloor, which was not something we were prepared for. It's not something that we thought could ever happen, that years afterwards there still be human remains on the seafloor. The whole emotional part of this expedition just brought us to a place that we'd never been to before. 104 bodies are recovered along with the wreckage. A few weeks later, and nearly two years since the crash, French investigators locate what they have been desperately hoping to find, the flight data and cockpit voice recorders. Air France 447 disappears over the Atlantic outside the reach of radar. No witnesses, no mayday. It takes nearly two years for the wreckage to be found at the bottom of the ocean. After downloading the information on the flight data and cockpit voice recorders, investigators began to unravel just what happened on board the Airbus 330. 447 was in normal cruise at 35,000 feet. Autopilot was engaged, auto throttles were engaged, routine event. About three and a half hours into the flight, the captain leaves the cockpit to take a break, trading places with one of the two co-pilots. The plane is experiencing some light turbulence as it flies through the volatile intertropical convergence zone. Here, warm, humid air rises, cools, and condenses into large cloud formations. But what the pilots could not know is that ice is building up inside critical sensors called the pitot tubes. Pitot tubes are a long utilized, well established device to measure airspeed. They can be susceptible to icing, and as a result, they're heated. But the icing is overwhelming the heating capabilities, and the pitot tubes freeze up. In a highly automated airplane, if you ice over that tube, you no longer have that ram air pressure, which all of these computers are dependent upon. With no valid airspeed to work with, the autopilot and other automated systems disconnect. The co-pilots must manually fly the plane without the ability to monitor their airspeed. The big thing is to not make any major changes with the airplane. In all likelihood, it's going to recover shortly. If you start making large inputs, things can get worse. With the captain still away from the flight deck, the co-pilot in the right seat, the youngest and least experienced on the crew, attempts to level the plane that's being jostled by turbulence. But he overcorrects on the side stick controller, pitching the airplane up at a steep angle. Those inputs were massive, both in, in magnitude and in duration. The airplane is going to react more violently than at lower altitude or with the automation. The stall warning sounds twice in the cockpit. Stall, stall. The airspeed indications have been invalid for less than 30 seconds, and now they're coming back online. But in that time, the flight has destabilized, and the aircraft is rapidly climbing at a rate of 7,000 feet per minute. Things get confusing quickly, because you look, 
wow, look at all this airspeed I have. But yeah, you've got airspeed, but you have no lift. Airflow over the wing is ultimately critical for generating lift and supporting the weight of the airplane. So you can pitch the nose of the airplane up, but the airplane will fall out of the sky because the wings are incapable of generating enough lift. The pilot wasn't monitoring his altitude, really didn't know that he was at 38,000 feet. As the airplane reached its maximum altitude, it can't climb any higher. And if they stall it, there's not a lot of air to work with at that kind of altitude. The wings lose lift and the airplane stalls. It begins to free fall, descending steeply at 10,000 feet per minute. But there is confusion in the cockpit. The pilots don't realize that the plane has stalled. Lowering the nose is the appropriate and only appropriate action that a pilot must take. Reattachment of airflow over the wings, get the wings producing lift, and then fly out of the stalled condition. But the co-pilot in the right seat does the opposite, continuing to pull up. This is the last thing that you would want to do. This is very counter to the training received. Why this occurred, it's one of the great mysteries of 447. The co-pilots have been trying to reach the captain since the autopilot disconnected. It takes 90 seconds before he returns to the flight deck. They didn't brief the captain and tell him, this is what's happening. We don't have control of the airplane. They lacked then the capability of that entire team to problem solve it together. The captain also fails to recognize that the plane is in a stall. It has been plummeting for nearly three minutes. Recovery should be easily attained within 10 to 15 seconds. So the idea of it being three minutes in a stalled condition is extremely long. In the final minute, the cockpit voice recorder may reveal the captain realizing that the co-pilot has been pitching up, causing the plane to stall. But I've been at max nose up for a while. No, 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 don't climb. In an aircraft with a side stick controller, you may not notice this slight motion. It doesn't take a lot. So it is possible that you could have a full aft stick input and the other crew members don't notice it. The airplane is only seconds from hitting the ocean. The passengers really probably didn't understand what the gravity of the situation was. They only knew, possibly, that they were entering an area of turbulence. Air France 447 smashes down belly first into the Atlantic, killing everyone on board. Autopsies of the victims reveal compression fractures of the spinal column and pelvis, injuries compatible with a seated person hitting the surface of the water at high vertical speeds. It's still unclear why the pilots did not recognize that the plane had stalled, despite the audible stall warning that at one point sounded for 54 continuous seconds. It may have been that it became a nuisance warning because they had heard it intermittently before. They didn't know if it was valid or not, and they decided to disregard it, but we'll never know. They never discussed it. The official French investigative report states that a phenomenon called the startle effect may have played a role. It's similar to walking into a room that's dark and somebody jumping out and saying boo. It's that instantaneous you know, scare, if you will, okay, the autopilot's off, why is it off, what do I need to do? And now you're having to process all this information in a very compressed timeline. Human beings, when they're very, very, very focused on one task, things will drop out. Oral inputs are one of the first to go. So this is consistent with this pilot not hearing, therefore not responding to the stall point. Prior to the crash of Flight 447, Airbus and Air France had recognized the potential problems with pitot tubes freezing over and had begun modifications just two days prior to the accident. The official report maintains that improving pilot training, including exercises dedicated to manual aircraft handling, is the key lesson of Flight 447. You had professional pilots who'd gone through professional pilot training but none of these pilots had ever been trained to fly the airplane manually at high altitude with these levels of sensitivity. February 19th, 1985.
China Airlines Flight 006 is cruising at 41,000 feet above the Pacific Ocean. 274 passengers and crew are on board, traveling from... Taiwan to Los Angeles. It was my birthday and my friend told them that, you know, his birthday, so he's, let's have a celebrate up in the air. And so that's what we did. And we just kept drinking, they bring champagne, singing happy birthday. 10 hours into the journey, the crew notices a sudden loss of thrust in the Boeing 747's number four engine. The normal procedure is if you lose an engine, you're gonna have to come down. The crew must descend to 30,000 feet where the air is denser so they can try to restart the engine. Instead, the captain asks the flight engineer to try to restart engine number four while they're still at 41,000 feet. The restart attempt fails, and the continued loss of thrust begins to slow the airplane down. But that's not the only problem. If you have the failure of one engine, you now have an asymmetrical or unbalanced power, and the airplane will tend to want to roll toward the failed engine because there's more power being produced on the other wing. The airplane is rolling to the right toward engine four. The first corrective action is to apply rudder to balance it. Switch the autopilot off, make the corrections, and then you can re-engage the autopilot. The autopilot doesn't use the rudder. It uses the ailerons, which are the little flaps on the ends of the wings. But the ailerons aren't enough to correct the roll. The captain is preoccupied with a problem in engine four and continues to keep the autopilot engaged. It's similar to your car. You can only turn your steering wheel so much, and then you come to a stop. That's what happens in an airplane. The autopilot can only roll those ailerons in so much, and then it comes to a stop and says, I can't do this anymore because I can't move the ailerons anymore. You need to do something else to stop this roll. It's been more than three and a half minutes since the failure in engine four. The captain disengages the autopilot. The crew knows the plane is banking right, but they don't realize just how much it is already rolled. The confusion on the flight deck on that airplane was, was extreme. They were in clouds, so they didn't have a way to look out and see a natural horizon. They were dependent on the instruments. And in that particular instance, the pilots would have been looking at their ADI, which is their artificial horizon that shows the level of the wings compared to the horizon. When the crew, the captain, looked at his ADI and saw an attitude on the indicator that was not what he expected, he thought that the instrument had failed. So when they decided not to believe their instruments, then they're left without any ability to tell which way up they are. There was nothing wrong with their instruments. Their instruments were showing correctly what the airplane was doing. The airplane has rolled more than 60 degrees to the right. The nose pitches down, and the plane enters a nosedive. I just heard a very loud noise from the airplane. So due to our training and my instant, I just immediately ducked down and grabbed the nearest chair arm. Eventually, the airplane is almost vertical as it descends very rapidly and at very, very high speeds toward the Pacific. China Airlines Flight 006 is crossing the Pacific when it loses thrust in one of its engines, causing the airplane to roll to the right. The crew is preoccupied with restarting the engine and fails to disengage the autopilot and manually straighten out the plane. When they finally disengage it, the airplane is in a dangerous position, having rolled much more than the crew realizes. The Boeing 747 begins plummeting toward the ocean. Former flight attendant Angie Wang has just finished serving breakfast to the passengers. Suddenly, I feel my leg so heavy. I just feel as uh, I was about to be thrown to the ceiling. All the people who were serving us, they were just rolling down the aisle. 
All the tray, the noodles, cup, everything was just flying towards the front of the plane. I thought, we are gone. There's no way we're going to survive this. In just 30 seconds, the plane has fallen more than 10,000 feet. They're overspeed a lot. This is a condition that you can actually physically pull an airplane apart. For the pilot, he had to get himself oriented. What was the airplane doing? Was it right side up? Was it upside down? The G-forces bearing down on the passengers and crew are enormous, exceeding five times the force of gravity. This means that a 200-pound person would feel like 1,000 pounds. You don't know if your brain was going to explode or what. Everybody's face was just kind of pulled back, like being stretched. You couldn't open your mouth, you couldn't move your arms, you couldn't move your anything. There was complete silence because you can't even make a sound. When they were trying to figure out what was going on, the crew found themselves with their faces pressed down onto the control column because the G-forces were so strong. forces of the air and G-load are so powerful that the doors covering parts of the main landing gear are ripped off. Big boom. I thought the, the plane just blew up. You know, but, and I opened my eyes. I'm still here. And it's still falling. At the back of the airplane, the tips of the horizontal stabilizer separate from the tail. They have fallen another 20,000 feet in less than two minutes. The airplane breaks through the cloud layer, and by chance, it's oriented right side up. Now they had a natural horizon to work with. They could look out the windshield and see which way was up, which way was down, and which way was wings level. But there's only 11,000 feet left between the airplane and the ocean. I can see the water. The waves break. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, like you have a magnifying glass. I just scream from my mind. I say, God, help me. The crew pulls up hard on the control column. And using the horizon, they try to level out the airplane, but they're still losing altitude. It felt like forever, but then it just stopped. Right after I call God, the sound disappeared and the pressure dropped down. Finally, after falling more than 30,000 feet in less than two and a half minutes, the nose begins to pitch up and the airplane levels out at 9,500 feet. The captain used very artful flying to recover the aircraft from a bad situation. Unfortunately, it was that same pilot who put the airplane into that bad situation. Flight 006 is no longer in a nosedive, but they are not out of danger. The crew realizes that with drag from the landing gear, they won't have enough fuel to make it to Los Angeles. Instead, they'll try to make it to San Francisco. They didn't know how much damage was done. Certainly in the back of their mind is, are the flight controls going to work on approach into San Francisco? Questions like that which would unfold as they got closer. Are we going to make it? still an hour and a half away. It's a long way to go. Now, at a lower altitude with denser air, the crew is able to restart engine four. Inside the cabin, the G-forces have taken a toll on the passengers. Many have sustained injuries. My back went out as a result of being pushed inside of a plane. People was just throwing up you know, or going to the bathroom in their clothes, in their seat. You know, it's a horrible smell. The crew prepares to make an approach into San Francisco International Airport. But the airplane is damaged, and the crew doesn't know if it's capable of landing safely. The people on top of the tower with binoculars, they're all checking the, the landing gear. If anything was missing or anything is broken. And I looked out the window, and there were ambulances and fire trucks and everything on each side of the landing strip. It touches down on the runway, and the landing gear holds the massive weight of the Boeing 747. I was excited. I'm still alive, you know, especially on my birthday, you know. 
But when we got out the plane, that's when I look up, man. The stabilizer were gone, about 10 feet of east side, wire hanging, big hole underneath the landing gear. The plane's wings are also bent up two inches from the aerodynamic forces. They're very fortunate that the airplane was so well built, so well designed, that even during this extreme maneuver, the airplane stayed together. When we met Captain in front gate, he just told us, you barely escaped dying. I was in the fog of just being grateful that I'm here. We have another opportunity. And uh, I hugged my kids and my wife. If the crew hadn't recovered Flight 006 from its nosedive, given their rate of descent, they would have collided with the ocean in 30 seconds. The captain, he's fortunate that he had 30 plus thousand feet to recover this high speed dive. Because had this happened at 20,000 feet, he may not have had enough altitude before the aircraft struck to affect the full recovery. The NTSB investigation determines that the captain's decision-making abilities could have been impaired by monotony, boredom, and fatigue. Jet lag pilots go across lots of time zones. Their sleep patterns are disrupted. There are studies that equate it to a blood alcohol level as far as impairment. So with a very fatigued pilot, you're going to have a performance degradation. The question is not if, the question is only in severity. Investigators believe that despite the malfunction of engine number four, the cause of the accident was the captain's preoccupation with the engine problem, his failure to monitor flight instruments, and his over-reliance on the autopilot. On a four-engine aircraft with the loss of one engine, that is not a catastrophic event or even an emergency event if it is controlled properly and it is handled by all the crew members. Automation is a great tool for pilots, but then it reaches its limit like anything else. Now it's up to you, the human, to fix this problem. February 25th, 2009. 135 passengers and crew are on board Turkish Airlines Flight 1951, traveling from Istanbul to Amsterdam. Sisters Hajar and Jihad Alariashi are seated in an emergency exit row. When they said that we are approaching Amsterdam, we kind of woke up, we fastened our seat belts. I remember taking my glasses, putting, putting them on my nose and looking outside, and I saw the ground uh, coming towards us very fast. And I said, whoa. And I looked at her, so I thought, oh, okay, this is weird. You know, I never feel this in an airplane. The Boeing 737 is descending rapidly through fog. The airplane is less than a mile from the runway at Schiphol Airport, when suddenly, disaster. It's like we were hanging uh, in the air, and then we dropped, and everything was shaking. The shaking. This side of the corner of my eye, I saw it drop, like a brick falling out of the sky. The airplane crashes down into a field, tail first. Ansgar Brenninkmeyer is driving nearby when he witnesses the catastrophe. I stopped the car, came over the highway, and then down the side here, across the water, and to the field over there behind us where the plane was. And I saw one man who was lying on the ground who had passed away and uh, had a sort of towel over his head. The business class had been crushed together, so the seats sort of went downwards into that mangled area. From a crash dynamic standpoint, a soft field is very difficult. The aircraft stops a lot quicker than if it's on a harder field. When the aircraft impacted the ground, it broke up into several pieces. The tail broke off and went at an angle. The cockpit broke off both in a lateral standpoint, but also had a lot of impact damage from the floor and below. The way in which the plane drops from the sky fuels early speculation that a weather phenomenon called a microburst may be to blame. A microburst is a condition usually created by thunderstorms where you have a column of air that is rushing downward. And it can be very, very intense. It has in the past shoved airplanes literally into the ground. Visibility was restricted in fog. 
which is not uncommon in the low countries, but there were no thunderstorms. So the conditions necessary for a microburst didn't exist. Inside the cabin, many of the passengers don't yet comprehend what's happened. I didn't realize that there was a serious accident. That the pilots had made a very hard landing. It was silent for about 20 seconds, half a minute, and then a lot of, a lot of noise. Uh, all the screaming people had a lot of pain, and it was terrible to hear that. Videos uploaded to the internet capture the aftermath. I sat in my chair waiting for the sign that we can take our seatbelts off and that we can get out. So I waited and waited, but I stared in front of me. I don't know if it was uh, like a shock. I looked up and looked around me, and it was very dusty, and it smelled as if you left the iron on for quite a long time. So it was a sort of burning smell. And I was like, I have no idea what happened. But there's something wrong and we need to get out. And I looked on my right side and I saw Jia just staring in front of her. So I looked at her and I shook her. I said, Jia, wake up, wake up. Something happened, we need to get out. And she looked at me and I said, open the door. And she was trying to get the door and, and, and which she had her seatbelt on. So you could see that she was struggling to get up. And I, I really didn't understand. And she had this panic in her voice that I thought, okay, something is wrong because she's acting very weird. She knows things that I don't know. And then she screamed again. What is wrong with you? Stand up, get out, get out. Disoriented, the sisters and other passengers climbed to the emergency exit and onto the wing of the airplane. I stood on the wing, and when I stood up, I felt pain in my belly. It was very painful. And I thought, what is this? I was just grabbing my hand because I had an injury. It was underneath my clothes, but I said, you know what, I don't dare to look. As we were walking, down the wing and the moment we had to jump we were like oh my god this is quite high we jumped and then i said to her we need to we need to go we need to uh, run because if, if something happens if it explodes we need to run we need to run we need to be safe and she said run run can you run i said uh yeah and i talked strange i i noticed myself talking like this that i couldn't breathe i said yes i can run and she said then run Videos uploaded to the internet capture the devastation. After evacuating the airplane, sisters Hajar and Jihad Alariashi are gripped by shock. My sister said, we need to call our relatives. I said, where's the phone? She said, in the airplane. So she said, you know what? I'm going back. I said, what? No, no. And I couldn't really speak. And I thought, how st stupid can she be? We still smell kerosene. There could be a fire. She's going back in the airplane. I got there on the wing and walked slowly towards the, the emergency exit. I got in again and I looked around. I was going into the cabins to get all my stuff. And then I heard a voice again and I looked at her and she was standing on the wing. And she said, I have all our stuff, all our stuff. And I thought she's really gone crazy. And I think I was in kind of a shock because I was saying things that didn't make any sense. If somebody would ask me, hey, if an airplane crashed, uh, would you go back? I would say, no, of course not. But I did something that I shouldn't have done. The sisters are treated for minor cuts and bruises. Nine people are killed, and nearly everyone on board suffers injuries. Many are serious. All three flight crew members were fatally injured. The five passengers were all in the forward part of the aircraft in the first class section. There was one other fatality of a flight attendant in the aft part of the aircraft where it broke apart. Most of the injuries were either broken legs or broken backs. And the surprising thing was that the people with broken backs could walk uh, out of the plane but then could no longer walk after the sort of first shock wore off. The plane is destroyed, but the scattered pieces give investigators their first clues as to what happened.
the engines were actually forward of the main wreckage so that they had traveled further than the, uh, than the rest of the wreckage. To us, it could indicate that the engines were producing power. The engines appear to have been functioning, but not much else is known. Trying to decipher what did happen, investigators locate the flight data and cockpit voice recorders. When they download the critical information, it reveals a dangerous chain of events on board Turkish Airlines Flight 1951. As the aircraft was coming in, air traffic control positioned the aircraft in a manner that caused them to be high. So once they did that, it required them to do a steep rate of descent. They were faster than they should have been. They were a little higher than they should have been. Air traffic control turned the airplane in pretty close to the runway, so they were descending quickly. They extended the landing gear and started configuring the airplane to land, knowing that they needed to slow down. But an indicator called the radio altimeter, used to measure the plane's height above the ground, has malfunctioned. It's showing that the plane is on the ground when it's actually still 2,000 feet in the air. The crew recognizes the problem, but what they don't realize is that the faulty altimeter reading will have a dangerous effect on the auto throttle system. This controls the speed of the airplane by adjusting engine thrust. The radar altimeter was sensing that the airplane was on the ground. It was telling the throttles to be at idle. The pilots expected them to be at idle, but only for the descent. This was the beginning of an ambiguous situation that the pilots don't know is unfolding. The airplane starts to slow down. The power does not come up as the pilots expected it to because the auto throttle system thinks it's on the ground. The airplane continues to slow. And another problem, the plane is nearing the runway, but the crew isn't finished prepping for landing. They didn't have the final flap selections made and they were still running the before landing checklist. Consequently, a go around was required by their operations manual, yet they didn't do that. So all those things that they were doing at that time was taking them away from actually monitoring their airspeed and altitude. Inside the cockpit, the stick shaker warning activates, telling the pilots that the airplane is about to stall. I think the stick shaker actually caught him by surprise. The trainee first officer did exactly what he was trained to do pushed the power up, lowered the nose. But the captain understandably said, I don't know what's going on here. I want control of the airplane because I've got so much more experience. Neither the trainee first officer nor the captain disengaged the auto throttle system. The result of not following that disengagement was that the auto throttle system drove the power back to idle. With no thrust to the engine, the airplane is losing too much airspeed. It takes nine seconds from the stick shaker warning for the captain to realize that the throttles are in idle. When he does, he pushes them to full thrust, but it's too late. By the time they realized what was occurring, the airplane went into an aerodynamic stalled condition and literally fell out of the sky a mile short of the airport. The plane shatters on impact into three pieces. The accident leads to significant changes in the industry. A recommendation was made to improve the reliability of the...